Well, thank you very much, Tammy, and uh, everyone in Harris County. You guys do great work and making Harris County and Houston the most international city in the country, definitely Texas, and making it even more so all the time. Uh, Congressman Hurd, uh, truly a, a delight to have you here today. And um, I just want to chance though, this, this book is excellent. It's, it's timely. It's what's needed to this country in a small way, in our very small way. It's what we try to do, hopefully, at the council, presenting both sides, presenting Democrats and Republicans, and hopefully helping people realize we have a lot more in common with Commissioner Booker repeatedly than we do in terms of our differences. And the really bigger, more dire threats are China, are Russia, are the rise of authoritarianism uh, in various places in the world. So we will get into your book, but um, you know, first I just want to open it with regards to what's in the headlines today, uh, sadly, for, for, for all the wrong reasons. Um, some of you may have come a few weeks ago when we hosted a uh, Russian dissident. Vladimir Karamurza, he's kind of the right-hand man of Alexei Navalny. He has the unfortunate uh, notoriety of having been poisoned twice and, and still keeps fighting for Russia. After he left here with us in February, a few weeks before the war, he went back to Russia. He kept speaking out. He's still speaking out. Uh, and he was arrested again on Tuesday. So uh, I just want to say whatever way you'd like to your thoughts, your prayers, or whatever uh, for Vladimir, and hopefully um, he gets some decent resolution down the line. Um, with regards to your book, and more importantly, your career and your years of service to this country, the Ukraine war represents everything that you've done. Uh, you have, you know, a, you know, you're a, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a computer science major at A&M, cyber issues involved. You have almost 10 years uh, as a case officer, uh, undercover and elsewhere uh, in South Asia and working with the CIA. You know the Russians, the Russian tactics well. Uh, you served in Congress where you repeatedly highlighted the threat of China, the threat of Russia, the need for um, a strong intelligence community. And when you got out, you've been an uh, executive in, in different cyber companies. So um, when you look at Russia now, um, another thing that I quite hope people will understand is the importance of American intelligence services. There are men and women who truly dedicate their lives to service most time quietly behind the scenes, people don't know where they're serving or how they're serving or if they even serve. Um, they have made mistakes, uh, but to me they're almost like the offensive linemen. You know, they do great work for years and years all the time, and one mistake, it can it look bad and glaring, but that's when the public knows about them. Um, to look at a more positive side of things, can you explain why, with regards to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, the intelligence services were so spot on, were so accurate. For weeks before the invasion, our intelligence community said there's a very high likelihood this invasion is real, it's going to happen. You know, Biden said the same thing. Some of our allies downplayed it. But what was it, do you think, without giving away too much, that gave such a high degree of confidence? Well, when you were mass. When you amass 120,000 troops on our border, that's a that's a good sign <laughs> that they're going to that they're going to do something. Um, the, look, the, the, the reality is, um, we also we always talk about intelligence and and failures or not failures. The the the, the, the issue is intelligence. Intelligence officers, our duty was to collect information on the plans and intentions of X. It is to inform policymakers. So policymakers can make decisions. This was a time when the intelligence was right and the po and, and trying to do the policy and got the policy right in articulating that, that intelligence. Now I compare this to um, Afghanistan, where it went the exact opposite way. The intelligence community in Afghanistan made it very clear, and they've been saying it for years, that the Afghan government could fall if we didn't have the right level of support. And that the Taliban could could you know, react quickly. Now, the CIA didn't say on Thursday, March seventeenth, this is what's going to happen. That's unrealistic to have that have that level of of of, um, of precision. And so, when it comes to when it comes to Ukraine, there's been a lot of conversation about the information we've been sharing around what's happening in, in Ukraine. Now, it's the right move. It should have been done, but whether this is some new strategy, and I think all the adjectives that have been used to describe it may be a little um, uh, 
that goes above what actually happened? Or is the information that we've been sharing going to result in the loss of, of sources and methods? No. The information that we're making public, a lot of that is stuff that we would have already been sharing with our allies if we were enjoying, if we were involved in this fight. And so it, it, it is the right move, and this should continue, but we still have to improve. The most important thing that intelligence collectors can do is what is the plans and intentions of Vladimir Putin? And trying to understand that, and, and, and the five people around him that are actually his, his it, it can influence him. It's all this talk about these oligarchs. Mm-hmm. Oligarchs have no juice when it comes to, this, to forcing Vladimir Putin to do something. Probably the most important person in Russia is the head of the FSB. Mm-hmm. He's been in that position, I want to say, about 24, 25 years. Which um, the position but, Putin had himself. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And so, so understanding... And for the FSB, you're trying to say that's the predecessor, that's... What's the KGB became, 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 became uh, yeah. the FSB. Yeah, yeah. and so it, it, it's there, it's, it, it's the Russian intelligence services. Um, and so understanding, understanding what would force them to make a move on Vladimir Putin. Um, most of the assessments right now is that they're not even close. One of the frustrating things is that the, the Russian people, the, the Russian people have the ability to absorb a lot of, a lot of, of chaos and problems. Um, the Russian economy right now is not as bad as it was back in 2008 when, when, the, when the, the rule was basically uh, worthless. And so trying to get, the, get public opinion to turn into public outrage, we're far away from that. And, and so that's why what's happening in Ukraine is it, what, what I believe we should be doing absolutely everything within our power to help the Ukrainians win the actual war. Give them every piece of equipment that they're asking for. Because the longer this conflict continues, the worse it gets for Eastern Europe. You have Eastern Euro- European countries, Slovakia, Romania, that are dealing with a population that's living under the threat of war. The closer you are to Russia, the more impact you're going to have from from sanctions and and the consequences of sanctions, and then you're dealing with the humanitarian crisis. Warsaw, last month, the the city of Warsaw increased 14%. Imagine if H-Town population increased 14%. And the pressures that that would put on on local institutions, on state institutions. So the longer this conflict goes, that tension is going to create tension within these Eastern European countries, which then puts tension in the Western alliance, which is exactly what Vladimir Putin uh, wants to see happen. So those are some of the intelligence questions that we need to be collecting on scene so that we're prepared to say, is there something we can do to influence those outcomes? And one of them is being a Marshall Plan uh, for, that, for, for Ukraine that starts in supporting those Eastern European countries. And just to follow up, you said basically whatever Zelensky and his uh, you know colleagues ask for, you you would you would try to provide that. Would that include you know beyond say the stingers, the javelins we're providing now uh, to advance anti aircraft systems that would be on the ground, or even some of the MIGs, Patriots, Iron Dome, you you name so it. You and, 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 and here's why. Here's why. So so I've been associated with the national security community for twenty one. Um, you know, I did two years in, in training in the CIA at, a, at what I used to call a super secret CIA training facility called The Farm. Now it's on Google Maps. Um, <laughs> you know, I wish that was a joke. Uh, it's true. I did two years in India, two years Pakistan, two years in New York City doing your agency work, a year and a half in Afghanistan where I managed all of our undercover operations and then um, helped start a cybersecurity company in, in Congress for, for six years. Um, on appropriations and then, and then the intel community. And, and, and I've learned something very simple in all these experiences that I boil down into my philosophy on, on foreign policy, and it's actually a, a title of one of the sections of the book. Your friends should love you, and your enemies should fear you. And so let's look at this situation now. There's been a lot of good, the, the support we have given is good, but it's not enough. When, Vladimir, when, when President Zelensky is asking for more help and saying we're not doing enough, 
when Boris Johnson is saying that we can be do, the Western Alliance can be doing more, that's an indication that your friends are not too in love with you. They're thankful for what we have done, but we can do more. And then when 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 Vladimir Putin is unleashing this level of death and destruction, he's doing it because he, he, he realizes no consequences. What the Russians are doing now on a scale of one to 10, probably somewhere between six and seven, what we're seeing happening in, in Mariupol can happen throughout the entire country. Now everybody says, oh, well, Will, you do these things, you give 20 megs to the Ukrainians, that's gonna escalate. Is it not escalating? Back in 2014, when the Russians invaded the first time, remember, they went to Kiev. They tried to go to Kiev, they got pushed back. Uh, we better not give defensive weapons in because that may escalate it. Don't do sanctions because that may provoke the Russians from going in. We've always gotten it wrong. Trying to understand second, third, fourth, fifth order of effects is super hard. So let's be basic. Start with the first principles. Prevent the massacre of innocent people. Let's do that. And then be prepared for the response. And so do you think Vladimir Putin, who's having a hard enough time already dealing with the Ukrainians, wants the Poles to come in? Wants the Polish army to come in? A, a more equipped, larger military? You think they want to see um, you know, French fighters? Macron would love for the next in the next two months to show that the French are, are fighting people, and that's going to help him in his reelection, right? And so, so, so for me, this notion that we, we it's almost this fear of what Vladimir Putin's going to do. We can't be afraid of him. And and and, and America's at its best when we are using not only our hard power but our soft power to support this international. And so the more we give the Ukrainians now to end this themselves and push the Russians out, then you're not going to see that level of frustration and tension that I talked about earlier. And we're not going to see the global supply chain issues, the energy problems. And that's why, that's why I think the amount of, of support we should be giving them should increase to everything that they can use. And and you're you are not saying put American troops on the ground. No, I'm not yeah. saying put American troops on the ground. Get, the, the Ukrainians don't need American troops. Yeah. They need heavy weapons. But and just you know, to, to the other side of the coin you know, here from is you know Vladimir Putin is a rational actor. He's smart. He's calculating. He way miscalculated here. But the threat is, you know. Maybe the only thing more dangerous than a thug or a dictator that's winning is a thug or a dictator that's losing. And you know, if you start losing badly, if things are going poorly at home, you know, there are ten thousand. You know, in a month there are thirty thousand dead Russian soldiers. Um, are you concerned at all that he's loosely referenced it at the beginning of the war? He's escalating, elevating the, the level of nuclear alert on the country. Sure. Um, people might remember a few years ago there was the video of part of his kind of State of the Union where he had a video, mocked up video of a, a nuclear warhead coming down over southern Florida, not far from Mar-a-Lago, which you know, was not that's way to show your friendship. You're not concerned that he might maybe use a small tactical nuclear weapon, maybe somewhere remote just to show this is what I can do. Uh, or he might have already used, you know. Of course I'm concerned. Weapons. Of course. But allow the massacre of tens of, of thousands of people for a scenario that may or may not happen, regardless of what we do. So when, when Vladimir Putin made this statement about the nuclear weapons, uh, a lot of people in the and the, the nuclear armament community was trying to parse what he said because he used an imprecise language. And folks think he did that on purpose. I, I, always, I always caution people to say, to use the, the adjective crazy to, to, to describe Putin because crazy to me shows a, a disassociation with reality and what's happening. He doesn't care. It's, it's an evilness. It's, it's a lack of compassion for significant death, destruction, and, and heartache. And so, so when he made this decision about the nuclear weapons, the way, the way most countries use nuclear weapons, your fuel and the missile in two different places, um, the button is not connected, right? You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta connect it to a missile. When you push the button, something works. Most people thought what Putin was talking about was connect the button. 
Because you didn't see the fuel move, you didn't see the missile heads, those things. The last time something like that happened was in 1973. And Nixon did it. Nixon uh, escalated to show the Russians in the Yom Kippur War, stay out of it. That was the last time that we had come close um, to that, to that, to that, to that position. Every and, and the Russian military order of battle includes a escalate to de-escalate, meaning loose one nuclear missile, get everybody to calm down. But in every war game since nineteen since the seventies, when we play this out, escalation and de-escalation doesn't work. Escalation needs more escalation, and that's usually a certain destruction. So I can about this scenario absolutely. But it's the same scenario we were in under the last administration with the head of the Iranian Quds Force, the, the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, Quds Force. This is the equivalent of the Iranians, Special Forces in the CIA, kind of, kind of the one. Mm-hmm. And Suleiman, uh, uh, Qasem Soleimani, we launched a missile and took him out. He was probably the largest supporter of state sponsors, who probably killed more American troops than probably any other, any other government official. And everybody was like, that's an escalation. The Iranians are going to respond in a way that, and, and everybody was upset. And what happened? It was a minor response that we were prepared to defend against. And so, so for me, the if we're able to prevent the death and destruction, we should do everything in our power in order to do that, and be prepared that if they do want to lose a, a nuclear weapon then we should be in a position of trying to defend against that. And if we can't defend against that, that's a much larger problem that we should be working towards. And I, I know you're not a you know, general or, or military strategist, but if Putin gets desperate enough, uh, really feels the tables might turn on him, maybe he's, he, even his own inner circle, if they did use a tactical nuclear weapon, not necessarily in Maripol or in the city of uh, of you know Dinox, Skonets, or Hans, but but maybe you know out in the areas along the front lines where where the Ukrainian army is dug in, they use tactical nuclear weapon. It's devastating. It's all range of a mile, so and they kill a few hundred or thousand people. What's an appropriate response? That is a great question, right? And, and I don't think we get to that. And here's why: um, Vladimir Putin knows. That the 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 people around him that could potentially get him out of office are not close to that. He knows his population is not close to that. In in the eyes of the of the Russian people, the Russians are not losing. So so this notion that that Vladimir Putin feels like look, is he embarrassed from the rest of the, in, in the United States? He doesn't care. He cares about staying in power. He cares about reestablishing the territorial integrity of the USSR. He cares about using Ukraine to go into Moldova and into Georgia and then eventually Estonia and other places. That's what he cares about. And so there's a certain point where you can't have a complete scorched earth policy because it goes against what his what his philosophy is. But these are the kind of conversations that we should be having, our planet should be having. So is an appropriate response to the use of a nuclear weapon doing one ourselves? That doesn't seem that doesn't seem normal, right? As a, as a normal response, and this is why all these years when we've been looking at nuclear proliferation, that we should have been a little more focused on it because we all thought, oh, come on, nuclear war is never going to happen. Well, now I also think a well, way to end this conflict: the Ukrainians do not are not willing to offer anything that the Russians are willing to accept that Vladimir Putin would think would be a face-saving um, option to, to say, hey, we won. But the U.S. moving some nuclear weapons out of Europe and a de-escalation of, of in, in improving a nuclear-free zone in Europe where they remove, uh, they don't put um, um, missiles in, in Belarus, they remove some from their eastern borders. Uh, that's actually one of the ways that the Cuban Missile Crisis um, ultimately got um, got resolved, and so I think there's a very people took we took quietly took nuclear missiles out of Turkey. Yeah, so, which were actually already supposed to be taken out, but we made that more public, and and that made it look like it was a response. Oh, and by the way, a lot of people don't know this. 
in the Cuban Missile Crisis, we didn't know the Russian submarines had nuclear tipped missiles. And an admiral of a, of a nuclear submarine thought he was being attacked, gave the order to, to launch a nuclear torpedo. His second in command was like, hey boss, bro, he may want to pump the brakes on that. And, and thank God he was able to, to, to de-escalate that. But we didn't know that until I think in the 80s um, after some of the reports that were, that were gotten out. So we've come close to this, this kind of thing. And, and these, are, look, these, are, these are crazy, scary times. But this is why we need people making these decisions that are willing to think through these scenarios, have debates. You know, this is where you need to have um, a, a competition of ideas on the things that we should be doing because the consequences of these outcomes are serious. And trying to, to degenerate all this down to 280 characters in, in, in Twitter or a four minute segment on cable news is not enough. And that's why we should be having real debates on what should our policy be and what is, if something, if A happens, what is our response? These are the kinds of conversations that we need to be having. And unfortunately, it's not happening at the level I think it should be. And uh, just the last question on, on the topic, we'll move on to the, the, the core of your book. Um, obviously, besides your many years in intelligence, you're also a, a cyber expert, you're a cyber executive now. Are you surprised uh, we're whatever, you know, six weeks into this war at the relatively low level of cyber response by the Russians? You highlight in the book that 2007 attack were a massive attack on Estonia, the first full-scale, widespread, major cyber attack across all levels of one nation. Are you surprised the Russians haven't done more? Uh, or is it that they're holding off for kind of a bigger punch later? The reality is that the Russians have tried and they've been unsuccessful. So I'm surprised at their inability to execute on some of the cyber operations that they've tried. Now, how come they were allowed, they didn't, they didn't, they weren't successful? Back in December, um, the, these, you know, whether it was the Department of Homeland Security, DOD, all these entities were working with um, critical infrastructure providers here in the United States, but also with Ukrainians and our allies in Europe to make sure to harden their, their defenses and getting ready for some of these attacks. So the, the preparations that were done to defend were pretty, were pretty excellent. Um, we've even seen some of the Russians use a zero-day vulnerability. Zero-day vulnerability, most hacks, 80% of the hacks that happen are stuff that we know that there's a problem that needs to be fixed. It's just someone's been lazy and hasn't, hasn't fixed it. Um, a zero-day is a, a previously unknown hole in software and, 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 and those are the hardest things to defend against. The fact that the Russians have been able to use that and we've been able to help defend and the Ukrainians have been able to defend is, is, a, is excellent. Now, the other thing is the, the Russian government, this is not going the way they expected. They're probably on plan E, right? It's not even plan B, it's plan E. And the fact that the, uh, it's going so poorly, the, the ability to broaden kind of the tools of conflict um, has been limited because of lack of, 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 of a bandwidth to do that. All right, great. Um, your book uh, opens with an excellent story of, we mentioned your time undercover in the CIA, and uh, you're surrounded by a mob in a, in a, a difficult alley, uh, an intense kind of angry mob. Something has happened, and we'll give it away, people can read the book, it's great. Um, you talk about getting off the X, and the surprising effect of showing kindness and, and in a way really respect is how you help turn around the situation and get out of a delicate situation. And in a broader sense, your book is really talking about the idea of respect and compromise and working with others on a national level with regards to Republicans, Democrats, you know, working together. You know, let's focus on the people trying to work together in the middle as opposed to the fringes on the left and the right. Um, but you also talk about maybe needing to reassess the Republican Party and where it is. You mentioned the 2012 autopsy report um, after uh, Romney lost to Obama. Uh, you know, it highlighted reaching out more, focusing on issues related to minorities, to women. Um, you know, a lot of people said, this is great, this is excellent, work on it. Perhaps unexpectedly, Donald Trump came along, kind of turned all that on his head, and basically used a different segment of the populace to perhaps get votes. Um, got some you know, changes in some minority votes, say Latin votes. 
But what you say to the Republicans who say, we don't really need that report. What we need is, is what we saw that work with Donald Trump. Um, I don't care that we haven't won a majority of Senate votes in the country since 1998. I don't care that seven of the eight last presidential elections, we've lost the popular vote. This is a winning game plan. Uh, we'll focus on our base. How do you counter that? Winning to get what done. It would, would be my simple response to somebody who, who says that. But I, I started the story, I started the book out with that story about being up. It, it, when you're in the farm, that's the second lesson you're taught. Get off the X. The X is where something's going down, and the last place you want to be when something's going down is where it's going down. So get out of that way. And we are at a point where 72% of Americans think the country's on the wrong track. This, this has been growing over the years. We don't have to continue on the current trajectory. For the last 30 years, uh, political pundits, the professional political class has thought the only way to govern is to have uh, one party rule, where one party controls the White House, the House, and the Senate. That's actually the worst way to govern. Every major piece of legislation we can name, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, um, uh, Clean Water Act, Americans with Disability Act, the Every Student Succeeds Act, the, um, the First Step Act, uh, everyone was always done with a with a Congress of you know that the Senate of one party and the House of a different party and 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 mixed presidencies. That is how things continue and last. And when you when you have these 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 changes every two years. Nothing gets done. Um, asterisk, one thing gets done. President Obama got one thing done. The Affordable Care Act. Donald Trump got one thing done. The tax cut. And so this, this notion, and, and at a time when the world's getting increasingly complicated and interconnected, at a time when we are in a broader challenge to our supremacy in the rest of the world by the Chinese government, uh, we need to be able to do multiple things at the same time. And the best way to do that is to broaden coalitions. Both parties right now are all about driving their current existing people out and not trying to grow their, their coalitions. And, the, and, and that's where the opportunity is. The 2020 election, I'm not, I'm not here to get too political. There's two lessons of the 2020 election. Don't be a jerk, and don't be a socialist. Don't be a socialist jerk. <laughs> no, 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 look, look. I mean, I, I'm just, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and so, 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 but what happened? Republicans became bigger jerks, and Democrats became bigger socialists. 2022, Republicans are taking the House back. That, that, that's almost a fait accompli. Likely to take back the Senate. And we're going to learn the wrong lesson. We're going to think they love us. No. They really don't like what the other side was trying to do. It's a very big difference. And so, so for me, the opportunity is to grow into these, these communities that we have a chance to grow into. And, and we're seeing that. Um, this next Congress, is probably, on the Republican side, is probably going to be one of the most diverse, diverse Congress, in, in, uh, diverse Republican Congresses. Um, in history, uh, you're going to see here in Texas, and I'm, I, I, I was a, the I was introduced as a, the only black Republican in the House for for a couple of terms. I'm a black Republican that represented a 71 percent Latino district on the board. Some of you are laughing because they're like no one thought I had a chance. <laughs> well, actually, Jerry, did. where's Jerry? That's the one guy. Jerry was the first guy that actually thought I had a chance. He showed up in my office in San Antonio. I'm like, why are you here? And he's like, I think you can win. I was like, really? Come in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, 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 so the, we're going to see probably three Republicans on the, on the, um, um, representing the board of Texas out of five, potentially four. So, so we have an opportunity. Let's take advantage of that and not result back to the same thing that's gotten us to where we are. Uh, the other, you know, great. And, and really depressing piece of news you give a book related to, you know, 
2020 election is what it shows for our congressional districts. Um, by 2020, it's estimated uh, now only about 16 or maybe 18, I even call it 20, out of 435 districts are maybe considered at play or, or have a chance of, you know, hard to determine if you're a Democrat or Republican win. You point out that those are the districts that are most effective. Those are the districts where somebody is a moderate, where they're willing to work with both sides, but we have a primary just, you know, system that's made it increasingly more partisan. Gerrymandering doesn't help. But how do we fix that? What, what do you think of, say, some states have tried you know, ranked choice voting, this idea of, you know, you, you list your, your candidates in order, it doesn't matter what party you're from, you know, the top two advance to the final election. How, how, can we take up, how can we take the extremists on both the left and the right Winning the primary system, system, sorry, primary races, and then effectively because they're in a Democratic Republican district, they've already won. Well, I get I get deep in the math on this in, in in the book, but here is here is the 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 reality. If I had a magic wand, I would make no. You guys can answer the question. Let's get this one. That's on the top since they put it in first. Um, if I had a magic wand, no district would be more than plus six in either direction. Meaning, you would, you would only have a, a seat be 56% Republican or 56% Democrat or less. Plus six is a jump ball. So you're gonna have more competition. Go to the last non-presidential election. 30, there was only 34 House seats that were competitive. And, and I define competitive as in the previous presidential election, People voted for one party president and the other party in the House. Only 34. It's 8% of House seats. That's 34 out of 435. So the average number of people that vote in a contested primary, so that means that whoever is wins the primary wins the wins the, the seat. The average number of people in the primary in 2018, 54,000 people. That means 26,501 people decided who 92% of our congressional districts are. In the general election, north of 260,000 people. What do you want? The more people voting, the better. So, magic wand, no more than plus six. I don't have a magic wand. So, what do you do? We need more people voting in primaries. It's, 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 it, it, it sounds simple, but it's hard. We also need people. So the, the first the first time um, I went to I, when I was in Congress I spoke at South by Southwest the, 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 the um, conference in, in Austin and I'm on a panel with some YouTube stars. <laughs> All four there was four other people combined had one billion with a B subscribers. At the time I had sixty. <laughs> Jerry and JC were two of those two. two of JC and my buddy from, from college. And one of the people was um, the digital director for The Rock, Dwayne Johnson. Okay. And this was when the movie Moana was coming out. And she goes, if Moana fails at the box office, are we going to say Moana is a crummy? Are we going to blame the consumer, the moviegoer? Or are we going to say the product, the movie Moana, was a crummy movie? Now, I'm not saying Moana was crummy. I've seen it. I thought it was a delightful movie, um, very successful at the box office. And then she added, she goes, but in politics, it's the only industry where we blame the consumers, the voters, for not doing something rather than blaming the product, the politicians that are running for office. So the next way we fix this is we've got to get more people that are running to inspire rather than fear monger. And, and that is, that's the option that was hard. I, well, all these things I'm describing. Yeah. You're not getting on Fox, you're not getting on MSNBC by telling a good story. Well, you, by, you by, are. By being positive. Yeah. Look, my social media following would be 10x what it is now if I said crazy things. But I don't say crazy things. Because I think that's part of the problem. So, so that's where I think the opportunity is. And here's what I've learned uh, being a member of Congress for six years. Members of Congress are best in the world at following the trend. Nobody wants to be first. 
nobody wants to be second, but they'll fight each other to be third and fourth. Right? And so, so that's how we do this. We 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 get leaders that are willing to inspire value in the fear monger. We get more people that are that are voting in primaries, and then we as as society need to model the behavior that we want to see. We do those things, we're gonna get off the X, and we're gonna make sure we're doing things that allows us to ensure that this century stays the American century. Right. I'm absolutely supportive of that, and thank you. You absolutely are the example of being a, uh, not jumping on the following a trend in Congress. So I want to admire you for, for voting your conscience and your principles uh, above all, uh, beyond most congressmen, Democratic or Republican. Uh, we don't have time to get to all of the great stuff that you cover in the book. I highly recommend it, and he's kindly, uh, Congressman Kurt's going to sign them afterwards, and sell, sell them afterwards. But you maybe buy more than one. I see my friend yeah. has four, so I somebody have five already. Um, one topic that's a big topic for the country, uh, for Texas in particular, and especially for your district, running from San Antonio down to the Rio Grande, all the way to the edges of El Paso, almost 800 miles on the border, I think, uh, is immigration. You, you discuss it more in depth in the book. But can you talk about? Um, your attempts at what was to be the USA Act and kind of the realistic middle ground of most people in Congress realizing we need an effective border, but a smart border, like you mentioned, and then on the other side of it, we need kind of reasonable immigration policies, say, with regards to DACA and those kids. Sure. Could, you, could you maybe define your immigration policy or stance? Yeah. This is still an issue that gets me worked up. It's the, lo the longest chapter in the book. Um, it's one of the things that I've been most frustrated with. And, and, and so, so for some context, you mentioned, I represented 29 counties, two time zones, 820 miles of the border. Um, it took 10 and a half hours to drive across the district at 80 miles an hour, which was the speed limit in most of the district. Um, found out the hard way is it's not the speed limit in all of the district. Um, and, and it was roughly the size of Georgia. I'm the only member of Congress and I may be, it was the only member when I was in, and I may be the only member of Congress in history to ever stand to be so. That was my day job you know, um, back in the day, and then I did my real job at night. And then also, I may or may not have- now Just for people who may not understand, occasionally at embassies and consulates, not everyone works directly for the State Department. They have a State Department job during the day, but they're working for uh, it tells you services at night. I, I, can, I can neither confirm nor deny your uh, your your answer. Um, and 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 I also may or may not have been responsible for crisscrossing borders in alias and assumed names. So I know a little something about the border. The it's, it's a absolute crisis. What's happening right now? It's the worst it's ever been. Department of Homeland Security, this is Department of Homeland Security's own numbers. That as we get into the summer, you could potentially have 450,000 people coming across our border a month illegally. That's a month. Now, what should we be doing about this? Number one, don't treat everybody like an asylum seeker. This was a practice that began in the last administration and continued under this administration. Asylum has very clear rules. You gotta be part of a protected class. You have to be in a, we're in a country where your government is, is persecuting you because you're part of that protected class, or the government is incapable of defending you because you're being persecuted you're being part of that protected class. Treating everybody as an asylum seeker is preventing people that actually have asylum that have a true asylum claim. Stop doing that. Two, it is very hard to get from Tegucigalpa to Eagle Pass. It is infrastructure that is in place of human smugglers and human traffickers that are moving folks here. We have a lot of the information around uh, on the, that infrastructure, but we're not doing enough to dismantle it. And so our intelligence communities are doing more on collecting that information and working with our allies in the region to dismantle those networks that are moving this level of traffic up to the border. Do those two things. Oh, by the way, streamline legal immigration. 
Every industry needs workers. In this day and age, we should, Texas needs more, more tourism workers, and Florida needs more agriculture workers, and California needs more stevedores, then we should be able to do that um, month to month. Oh, and by the way, when you're dealing with a potential uh, upcoming recession and you're dealing with high inflation, you need, you want more people paying taxes. And what's fascinating to me about the actual streamlining of legal immigration, all these things I talked about, 70% of Democratic voters agree with all these things, and 70% of Republican primary voters agree with all these things. However, both sides would prefer to use this issue as a political bludgeon against each other than solving the problem. So, as with most things, the actual solutions are quite straightforward and simple. We need people to have a political will in order to do these things. And, and this is going to continue to be a problem until we have folks who are willing to show real leaders to make these changes. Okay, great. I'm just going to turn to uh, audience questions. Um, kind of a split between domestic and political questions and, and foreign policy questions. Um, or is, sorry, guys, not a lot of good questions. Um, someone asks, um, could you discuss dark money and that's driving uh, public opinion and public policy? And then similar to kind of maybe you could extrapolate a little bit more upon something we were talking about just a minute ago. Uh, Betty asked, what is your opinion of ranked choice voting uh, or any other you know, options that are similar to, to get more people voting? Um, so like money and, and, and let's just like it, so I think make it easier to vote. You should be able to register online. I should be able to register the same day. Um, I actually think we should get to a point where we can vote online. If Estonia can do it, and Estonia, now look, Estonia is only a country of 1.4 million people, we're roughly the size of San Antonio, uh, but they are dealing with the physical threat of Russia as one of their neighbors, and they're dealing with constant cyber attacks from the Russians every day. If they can vote online, we should be able to sort that out. Um, ranked choice voting, for me, I, I need to wrap my head around how do you run a campaign with ranked rank choice voting? And, and does, like, I, the, those kind of scenarios to me, and my concern is, would somebody's opinion change if they knew the, the, um, the choices were whittled down? So, I, you know, I, I appreciate this as a potential solution. I need to get my head around some of the scenarios and how this would, would ultimately work. Things like, like jungle primaries where everybody runs top two, I would love that. That's like, that would be perfect. I'd be perfectly suited for something like that. Um, but this is all going to require people voting in uh, changes made in 50 states. Dark money. My father was a traveling salesman who sold notions. Zippers, threads, buttons, things like that. When he retired from that for 30 years, my mom and him created a, a beauty supply. And so they sold beauty products to, 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 um, uh, to salons. I say that to say, I did not come from a wealthy family. I spent, before I ran for office, I was a government employee. So I did not have, I did not come from wealth, I did not have access to capital run, but I, I had an ability to raise money. And that allowed me to go against, uh, my opponents were always self-funders, people that were multi-millionaires and used some of their own money. Now when I look at some of these super PACs and some of the dark money, and again, I've had these groups support me and drop, in, in my three races combined, all sides combined, probably $70 million spent, you know? And, and more of that was against me. And this is a, a not a wealthy district. That's not a wealthy district. I, I knew these ads were working when my buddy's son, six-year-old son comes in one day crying. It's like, why is the TV saying Uncle Will's bad for Texas? <laughs> That's a good ad, you know? Um, and, and so, so, but the people that benefit from all this, the professional political class. My general consultant was a multimillionaire, but my chief of staff had a hard time buying a home in Washington, D.C. Right? Like, and, and so, so, so there, there has to be a way that, that um, the influence of these, and at, at a minimum, we should know where all that money is coming from. So we have a clue, clear idea of who's trying to, who's trying to influence the election. I think that's a, that's a start that most people would agree with. 
Uh, I'll tell you that my question, my answer is we have a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah so thank you very much. Uh, and kind of following up on, on especially domestic politics, uh, William asks, what, what can we do about social media and how much is it to blame for highly divisive uh, you know, climate? It's contributed. None of us would have thought when this stuff was first started that it would lead to young girls cutting themselves. I was going to start with something like that. So the, the, a lot of these algorithms were designed in order to, to propagate something that created emotion. So that's why everybody says crazy things. It's either you say crazy things or you do a funny dance. Right? Um, now, I think a mistake was made by giving these social media, acting like these social media companies were different than any of the other traditional media. Yes, the way they operate, you know, the, the, the guts of these systems are different than newspaper or the television, but if we would have treated them from the very beginning in the same way, maybe we would not have seen, seen the same issue. So I believe that these are content providers and they have an editorial control, and so that they they should be held similarly responsible for libel laws as TVs, newspapers, and other places are. Now, I think there's a whole number of ways you could that these platforms could do something like this. The scary thing is what these next tools are going to do. Yeah, I, um, the technological explosion we're going to witness in the next forty-seven years is going to make the last forty-seven years since the um, wide-scale use of personal computer it looked like the last 47 years we were monkeys in the dirt playing the stairs. And, and we need time to talk about what you cover extensively in the book. Yeah, from, from, from 5G sure. to AI uh, to quantum uh, computing. Yeah. Yeah. Right now, a company I'm on the board of, we have a tool where you enter text an impressionist version of the Mona Lisa painted in watercolor. You put that text in, and it shoots out 40 pictures that way. So the algorithm had to know and understand what, and this is not they scour the internet and find something like that. It creates a new image, pixel by pixel. Now, we said, hey, you can't use group photorealistic faces, you can't put people in there to prevent this sort of deep fakes of, of creating a new image and say, hey, you know, you did, you know, Ronan was, you know, doing something you shouldn't be doing, right? But are the Chinese government going to have those same level of restrictions? Absolutely not. So imagine some of these tools. So, so, so this is why we got to we got to address social media because the next tools that are coming, one, they're powerful and they're going to be amazing to have, but they're going to be also, you know, as all these tools, there's an upside and a downside. Um, I just combine uh, three of these because they're all uh, relatively. Uh, you know, in the similar arena, um, you know, uh, not, not to say easy or short answers, but I suppose that you could try. Um, uh, relating, they're all related to the war in Ukraine. Andrew asks, in Europe, uh, NATO in the U.S., you know, uh, how do uh, politicians and constituents uh, you know, get to be able to, to spend more on military defense? You know, who might have done more for that than anybody? Um, related to the war, uh, Melissa, oh, sorry, Alyssa asks, uh, is the main objective of Putin um, to get control of Ukraine and eliminate U.S. influence in Europe, uh, and in particular to control of Ukrainian oil and gas imports? And, and then lastly, Donnie asks uh, similarly, uh, is the goal of the U.S. ultimately to stop Russia or prevent World War III? Mm. Vladimir Putin cares about two things. Staying in power until he dies and reestablishing the territorial integrity of the USSR. Ukraine is a step towards that. That's what he's trying to do. He's gonna go beyond, he's gonna go beyond Ukraine. Um, is it to prevent World War III or to counter Russia? The, what we should be thinking about when it comes to, to, to um, Ukraine, and, and President Biden got, got, a lot of people criticized him for when he spoke in Poland, he talked about this, this uh, democracies versus autocracies. Some people criticized him and said he should be talking more narrowly to the objectives there. I actually think that was the right frame and the right narrative. What America should be doing is talking about how do we ensure 
this international order that we created after World War II, because we were not we were not afraid to use our hard power, but we also had our soft power um, to to establish an international order that led to the United States of America becoming the most important economy in the world. Because of what we did post World War II, half a trillion of global GDP is Europe and the United States. Seventy two years of peace and prosperity in Europe was good for America. And so how do we get the public to start accepting this? Is those of us that care about this issue and our, and our policymakers have to continue to make the case why these things matter. Foreign policy is not foreign. Foreign policy is about doing things that creates an environment in order for the United States of America to have the economy continue to grow. Oh, and by the way, uplift humanity. And so, so, but we have to make that case of why it matters. More people today understand why foreign policy matters because food's going up, because of, of weed issues in Ukraine and Russia, and the cost of putting gas in your car is going up. So people understand that connection um, better, but we have to continue to make that case. Okay, great. And if you're okay, if we just go extra five minutes or so, just yeah, talk sure, about sure. the last, last, yeah. nice last three, I'll just get through them quickly. But just on top of that, just to follow up to that, uh, Steve asks, um, kind of in summation, uh, your thoughts on uh, the position that uh, Putin uses himself, that you know, the EU, NATO, and the US share some uh, perhaps responsibility for Russia's uh, 2014, you know, 22 invasions of Ukraine because they felt, felt the inherent threat of the expanding wrong. NATO. It, it's, that's absolutely wrong philosophy, right? And, and that is playing, that argument is playing into Russian disinformation hands about what the Russians are doing. Uh, you, NATO was not going to invade Russia. Finland, Sweden, Estonia weren't, you know, drawn up plans to go to to go to Moscow. And so, so that is a narrative that the Russians are trying to create in order to make an argument and and uh, propagating that message. Whether you're doing it wittingly or unwittingly, means you're contributing to Russian disinformation. So no. Short answer. And just simply put, NATO stays at its nineteen ninety one borders. Putin has always wanted Ukraine. He's yeah. always wanted to be constituted Soviet Union. Um, that that would not have stopped him. No, I don't know. Okay. Um, I maybe mean, <laughs> two two sets of questions. I guess they're examples of to show that we are a bipartisan organization. Um, <laughs> they're not necessarily the, the most delicate questions. Um, uh, but uh, someone asks, um, can you compare any comparisons and compare personalities between Trump and Putin? And related to that, um, uh, Linda asks, um, you know, what's happened to Republican principles? You know, what do they support? Where are they now? Sure. So a, lot, a lot of Republicans feel it's not the party of Reagan or, or, or even either Bush. So, so I, I, I try not to talk about. I think when we talk about Trumpism in the Republican Party, is too narrow. It's authoritarianism within the Republican Party. And yes, all authoritarian leaders have similar, have similar, similar patterns. And, and look, my favorite podcast right now is a thing called Real Dictators. And if y'all ever heard, it's, it's amazing. It's like a couple episodes per dictator. And you're like, this really is like some of the same things, whether it's Genghis Khan or Papa Doc in Haiti. And, and so, 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 yes, authoritarianism, authoritarianism is literally on the rise. Democracy is, is fragile, always has been fragile. And so, you know, we talk about, and, and, and I will try to get the answers short. Um, we talk about the American experiment. Why do we say that? Because it really was an experiment. When we started this thing, nobody thought we had a chance. The rest of the world was like, laughing at us. It was another 60 years before another democracy came into the world, Switzerland. There are only 14 countries that have been a democracy for more than 100 years. We assume democracy is the only, is the only way that's out there, is the only thing that's, that's possible. It's not, like, like, and, and we're, we've been lucky to have lived under that. I remember my first class in foreign policy was talking about rule of law, I'm like, rule of law? Of course there's rule of law. It's a, it's a dumb class, right? Of course we have rule of law. And so I lived in places where there was no rule of law. Yeah. And then I was like, okay, they were right to teach that as the first lesson, right? And so, so we take for granted these things that make our country great. What should 
Uh, it, because of saying where the Republican Party is, I like to talk. I've never played hockey, but I, I've learned a phrase, skate to where the puck is going. This is where the Republican Party should be. And it's an old formula. Freedom leads to opportunity. Opportunity leads to growth. Growth leads to progress. And then we should be a party that's based on our values. And we should be being populated by leaders whose audio and video match. The things that we say matches up with the things that we do. And when you do that, that's how you repair this trust gap that we've seen at every level of society. Okay, and then, like I said, to, to be balanced, um, we've got references to Putin, and uh, on the other on the other realm, uh, we don't have to balance as bad as you know. uh, uh, you know, a historical figure uh, in terms of what he did not do. Um, two questions: Someone asks, "Are we here now because of uh, Neville, the Neville Chamberlain of our time, Joe Biden?" Uh, and uh, someone else asks, "The Biden administration is considering reentering the JCPOA, Iran nuclear deal." Um, that will be a pipeline for more bad behavior across the Middle East. How should U.S. allies in the Middle East uh, respond to this potential uh, deal? So, so appeasement, look, it's never worked, right? It's, it's never worked. And that's why this notion about, well, um, we should be afraid of, of Russia's nuclear capabilities, that's in essence an excuse for appeasement. And so appeasement never works. So, um, and, and, and I would say this, this, the political continuum is no longer a line, it's a horseshoe. And the edges are closer to each other than they are to the middle. And so there are this, this isolationist vein that's in both the Democratic and Republican Party is, has been growing over the last couple of years. And I think that is what's leading to, to many saying, JCPOA, no, we should not be getting involved in this. The last place you want to be is where your allies, Israel, and our Sunni Arab partners that are like, well, what is going on? And when we're worried about having that part of the Middle East supporting the West in sanctions against Russia, when you look at the list, of the, the map of only 140 countries, oh, excuse me, 140 countries out of 190 countries in the UN are not supporting sanctions against Russia. That's a fact. Yeah. It's based in the U.S., our allies in Europe, Canada, Japan. That's it. That's it. So, at a time when we're, when we're dealing with the current threat, part of my language, don't piss off your friends. And, 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 and the JCPOA, do we want a, a, a nuclear-free Iran? Of course. But we also want them to stop killing our, our men and women and supporting uh, terrorism around the world. We also want them to be a, a loyal... Um, uh, a, a regular member of society. We also have to stop threatening our allies in, in, in Israel. And, and, and saying that they can stop something for 10 years, and then after 10 years they can do whatever, that doesn't make any sense. And, don't, and, and instead of worrying about that, you should be in Western Hemisphere getting all of, of Central and South America on board with sanctions. You should be spending time in the Middle East and say, help, help us with 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 Russia, and at the end of the day, and, and I'll end with this: my last my parting remarks. America became an exceptional nation, not because of what we have taken, but because of what we have given. And when we remember that, and it's not just giving a helping hand to rebuild after a war; it is values and principles that have led to creating the greatest economy the world has ever seen, at the same time uplifting humanity. When we remember these things, and we make sure our foreign policy or domestic policy reflects that, then we're gonna, without a doubt, ensure that the rest of the century stays the American century. And that's what I, I, I want to take away uh, from this book because that is not guaranteed. However, as my dad told me, to always have a PMA, a positive mental attitude, I actually think our best days are ahead of us if we have leaders that inspire rather than fear longer, if we have leaders that have their audio and their video match, if we have a foreign policy that's based on making sure our friends love us and our enemies fear us, if we're able to take advantage of technology before it takes advantage of us. We do all these things, 
then the rest of the century is going to be the American century. And uh, again, I wanted to let you all know, uh, sorry before I bought it, we're, we're selling, uh, or donation, the donation, uh, uh, where we have a conscious for his excellent book, American Reboot uh, Outside, and he's kind of going to hang around and, and sign books as well. So uh, I just want to say on behalf of, of, of World Affairs Councils, all our members, guests, teachers, and students, um, you know, not just for this book, not just for what you're doing tonight and these last, you know, while, uh, but really for a career service to the country and intelligence services uh, in Congress and, and still working behind the scenes in ways uh, that we might see down the line. Uh, so I say thank you very much for all you've done for the country and we, we look forward to keeping up with you. Thank you.